Hey, Mar, I've started the recording, so uh, whenever you're ready. All right. <clears throat> so I think it's about time that we introduce our speaker. Robert Lightfoot is the Vice President of Strategy and Business Development for Lockheed Martin Space. In this role, Robert is responsible for growing the space business with a comprehensive strategy to develop new markets and keep programs sold. He also leads strategic planning, advanced technology concepts, and new business acquisition efforts for each of the five lines of business. Robert was the former acting administrator of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. His permanent position at NASA headquarters was associate administrator, the agency's highest ranking civil service position. He previously was director of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, one of NASA's largest field installations, which plays a critical role in NASA's space operations exploration and science missions. He spent most, much of his Marshall career in rocket engine testing and space shuttle propulsion office. He also served as director of the Propulsion Test Directorate at NASA's Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. After Stennis, two years were spent at NASA headquarters focused on strategies for the shuttle return to flight following the Columbia tragedy, then initial transition and retirement efforts for shuttle infrastructure. So I will let Mr. Lightfoot take it away. All right, thanks, Laura. I appreciate everybody being here today. It's a, uh, it's a good day to be in Tuscaloosa, is what I could say. I wish I was there with you uh, and not in the middle of this pandemic uh, to celebrate a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about engineering and what we're doing here at Lockheed Martin around space, but. Um, we could probably spend the whole hour talking about football if you'd let me, but I'll, I'll uh, it's interesting being in Denver celebrating an Alabama national championship. I think they're tired of me out here. <laughs> anyway, all right, so hey, what I thought I would do is spend a little time, um, if it's okay with y'all, talking a little bit about engineering from a career standpoint and what I've done here, and then I want to share with you, um, share with you what Lockheed Martin's up to, especially in areas that might be of interest to this particular team, right? I've kind of, there's too much to talk about outside of what we do here, but I can dial it down into, into some of the things we're doing that I think you might find of interest. So, you know, for me, the, 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 the thing I love about this team and, and the things that I've talked to, um, Dr. Ricks about it several times is you are a team. The, the way he runs your organization, I can tell you is very similar to the way you would, you're gonna work when you come into industry. Um, it's a team effort, takes a lot of different pieces, takes, takes as much business and, and, and leadership as it does engineering prowess, right? Um, I've seen many cases where the best technology in the world just doesn't get to, doesn't get fielded because the business side hasn't been worked. So I encourage you as you're going through this to continue to, to, to think about, um, that side of the, that side of the engineering activity. If you're hardcore engineering, there's plenty of hardcore engineering to do, but realize you're going to have people on the team that, that, that are going to be more aware of the business side of things and how things play out from a financial standpoint if you're going to a company, right? That's, that's a, been an interesting thing. So I think the way y'all are structured and the way y'all operate gives you some tremendous insight into that. Couldn't be more proud of you guys as talk about national champions. I mean, I, I, brag, I brag about y'all quite a bit out here. Um, when I talk to the teams that are building the rovers for Mars, I said, you just – go hire everybody from the team at Tuscaloosa. They'll, they'll build your next rover for you. They'll take care of it and you won't have to worry about it because they're already doing it today. Um, so, so they, again, they get tired of me talking about it, but it's easy when, when uh, you guys have won so many national championships in, in terms of the contest you're trying to meet and, and the requirements you're trying to meet. The other thing I'll tell you is that the, the, the other part of the process you go through that that's really, I think critical is, 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 learning how to take requirements and translate them into a product at the end. Um, that sounds very simple, right? Um, but it's also very painful. Um, I'm sure several, several of you have learned, have plenty of scar tissue already, um, just from going through how, how do you make a, how do you, how do you make, take, take a set of simple requirements and put them into practice, right? And under a set of constraints and, and, and then go back and review those, right? Review those, those, uh, uh, requirements with design reviews and system requirements reviews and all the things that that we love to do it, it's just a methodical way of thinking right that, that allows us to do that but but you also get these methodical ways of thinking you know systems requirement review preliminary design critical design you got to have an innovative way to do that as well you got to allow some innovation in there um, so that the good ideas can come forward too and so I, I just encourage all of you to Think about ways to include the entire team here to help you 
um, help you as you go through that. So what you're doing, bottom line is this, what you're doing today, and, and, and when we get to q and I'm gonna leave plenty of time for q and I hope that's okay, Laura, that, that was my, my intent was I, I, I probably won't be able to hit, scratch everybody's itch, so I'll leave plenty of time for y'all to ping me on just about anything you wanna ping me on, but, but I really want you to think about the fact that you are doing, in essence, what you will do from an industry standpoint when you get on a project team that has a goal, has a destination, and has something they wanna go do. So very encouraged with this program. It's one reason that, that I felt like at Lockheed Martin we needed to support it. So um, that's, a, that's a, a good thing for us as well, as well as it is for you, I guess, from that standpoint. So, so let me jump into my pitch and uh, um, I don't know how long, we'll, we'll see how long this takes, maybe 20 minutes or so. So I, I encourage you to be loading up the questions. Um, I'm, I'm, much, I'm much more about uh, answering the questions that you guys want to hear about, not, not what I want to say. So uh, we'll run through this and let me see if I can get this to work. All right, so you should see Lockheed Martin Space Overview. Laura, can you confirm that's what you're seeing on the screen for me? Yes, that's right. All right, cool. All right, so just to get it started pretty quickly here, this is uh, the Mars uh, Curiosity rover on, uh, actually this is the Mars 2020 artist rendition um, for this rover. Um, I'll be talking about this later, but this is the second large we call it the Mini Cooper size rover that, that uh, we've been part of and it's on its way to Mars as we speak, landing in February and I'll talk some about that mission as we go through, but I just love this, this graphic because it gives you an idea of what, what the Martian surface looks like and, and some feel that maybe it's not, doesn't, doesn't seem as different. You think, you think you could find a place like this in Utah or Arizona, New Mexico here in the States. So this is, this is space at a glance as I call it. Uh, um, the, 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 the key takeaway here is Lockheed Martin in general has, has four business areas. We have space where I work. We have aeronautics and aeronautics, uh, several Bama grads at aeronautics. They work things like the F-35, the F-16, C-130, Skunk Works. Is, you've probably heard of Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, which is our, our real technology development area. That's part of our aeronautics bunch. There's another group called Rotary Mission Systems and they, they have the Sikorsky helicopter line there. They do some ship-based work for um, for defense and they do a lot of cyber solutions for us. We also have missiles and fire control and missiles and fire control deals with things like THAAD and Patriot um, and some hypersonics work um, where we work closely together with them on that. So you can, there, that's the other parts of, of Lockheed Martin. <clears throat> and, and so while we have a, a particular line of bit, a particular business area around space, there's still some overlap in terms of, of how we how we manage across those business areas. And, and I have a counterpart in every one of those business areas that I work with pretty much daily in terms of how we can, how we can work together to leverage the strengths that this organization has. So if you look, at, and just to give you an idea, if you look at Lockheed Martin as a whole, you're talking about um, 110,000 folks, right? So it's the largest aerospace and defense contractor in the, in the world, and we are global. So you can see, um, if you look on the bottom right at the footprint for space, just for space, we're a little over 20, 21,000 folks and uh, um, all over the world, 190 locations. And, and it's been interesting for us during the pan pandemic, just like it has for everybody. We, we've actually still been hiring. We've, we've been considered essential. Uh, you can see I'm in the office today. Um, so I, I'll probably spend three, four days, sometimes five days in the office a week. So, so even with the pandemic, the work we do is considered essential and there's a lot of classified work, so you can't do that from home. Uh, and so we, we spend a lot of time here trying to make sure we're still delivering the missions for, for the customers we have. About 10.9 billion in sales um, in 2019. Um, and, and you can see our, our customers over there. It's, it's a commercial, we do some commercial work. We do Navy, NASA, um, the, the, the United Kingdom, um, the Air Force, and, and we do some classified work that, that, I, will, that I will not talk about today. Um, if you look to the left side of this chart, you kind of see the portfolio we have and I'll just start at the 12 o'clock position and work my way around. So strategic and missile defense, three big areas there that we work on. The first is the fleet ballistic missile. That's what you see in the picture there. This is the, the missiles that are in the tubes of the submarines. Um, we, we, we build that, we lead that, that activity. We've been doing it for over 60 years. It's a franchise for us. Um, have several partners, Northrop Grumman and others that, that partner with us, but we're the lead on that. So fleet ballistic missile is a large franchise program for us, but it 
awesome opportunity when you think about all the elements of engineering. I mean, these are missiles that have to come out of a sub, under the water, ignite, come out of the water and go land somewhere a long way away and, and, a and, and these are deterrents, right? You don't, we, these are missiles we don't ever want to use, right? And yet they have to work. So it's a very interesting, uh, interesting place uh, that we deal with and they go high enough in the atmosphere we have to deal with re-entry. So anyway, so it's a very interesting uh, situation. We also do hypersonics here. A lot of work in hypersonics, which is, uh, um, if, if any of you don't know what that is, it's really vehicles operating at you know, Mach 5, Mach 6, something like that, and, and they're actually more controllable. If you think of an intercontinental, inter, intercontinental ballistic missile, you know, an ICBM, it's just a parabola, right? It kind of goes up, comes down, and, and it's pretty predictable. Hypersonics, it goes up and it can go anywhere. It has the, could the, well, should be able to go anywhere. A lot of technical challenges there with, with guidance, navigation, materials to deal with that kind of a, that kind of a situation. A great systems engineering challenge um, for us. And then the, the next piece of this is the next generation interceptor. This is the, um, <clears throat> this is the, what we call our missile defense and this that we have in the United States where if somebody does, does launch something at us, we've got the, we've got the ability to go up and hit them at, a, a, at, a, at that level. So that's what happens there. Um, the reason it's in space, I told you I have a missiles and fire control department, uh, our, our business area. The reason this is in space is because frankly it goes into space, right? These things go above the, above the Kármán line, which is roughly 62 miles, 100 clicks um, up. So you have to have some understanding of space and the atmosphere and space and stuff. So Special programs, I won't spend any time on, that's all our classified work. Uh, Mission Solutions is the, uh, <clears throat> um, the team that does, really it's the ground part of space. Um, it's all the networking, all the data transfer, all the data collection, analysis, and things that go on. Really the connective tissue, they're kind of our backbone um, that do the work for all of these, all these other areas. You notice at the six o'clock position, we show um, uh, four what we consider subsidiaries of Lockheed Martin. We've got AWE, which is Atomics Weapons Establishment over in uh, the UK, where we run that for, for the missile of, or the Ministry of Defense in the UK. United Launch Alliance, which is uh, several, several Bama folks there. Any of you that know Peyton Drickland, I think he worked there this summer. He may be going there. Jane Gillette works there as well. These are folks I know that that are doing that. So um, that's one of the two big launch providers for the United States today. Zeta does some work in our classified area and Astrotech is an, is an organization down at Kennedy Space Center that actually processes payloads for flight. Uh, military space, basically this is where we do all the space communication, protected and secure communications, those kind of satellites. Um, early warning satellites are in here as well for, for things that we may, you know, when people, when people are doing things, we have a, we have some some missions that we do there. And then the GPS satellites are actually built here. So um, we fly GPS satellites, they're built here um, in Denver where I sit and uh, they're, um, we just launched one fairly recently actually. So we're, we're, we're in, we have that contract. And then commercial civil space is the one I'm gonna spend a little more time on because um, it kind of, for me personally, it's the intersection of my NASA life and, and what I do here at Lockheed Martin Space. <clears throat> so when you look at overall at what we've done for the years we've been here, um, over 800 satellites built and flown today to date. Um, you know, the Trident D5 is the one I was talking about earlier, 178 tests. We have to test those quite a bit, actually. You never want to have to use them, but we have to test them to make sure they're ready to go. And over the last 12 years, we've had 100% mission success, which is pretty, pretty unparalleled for us. Um, 310 payloads over the 50 years, and then we've supported, supported every, every NASA mission to Mars. We, we are the the, the company of business if you want to go explore in space, in my opinion. Here's to, so now I'm going to focus on the Lockheed Martin civil space side of the house, um, which I talked about a minute ago. This is where we do um, most of what I'll call the public side of, of, of NASA and Lockheed Martin. So you can see we have deep space, kind of break it into this deep space exploration. We've got Juno, Maven, Hubble, um, it's kind of an old one. The near cam is an instrument on the James Webb Space Telescope. Lucy is it going to be an? It's going to go exploring. Um, it's not launched yet, but it's going to be exploring. We have the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is at Mars. We have Insight, which is at Mars, um, and we have Osiris Rex, which you may have heard about this summer, or not to, this fall, when we went and uh, tagged the asteroid Bennu and are bringing back um, samples from there. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go into this. 
the human exploration side of this is where we do, we build Orion here, which is the spacecraft, the, the crewed space system that's going to take folks to the moon and ultimately onto Mars. Um, much, much larger, much um, more complex spacecraft than say the ones that go from SpaceX or Boeing just to low Earth orbit. These are built for deep space exploration um, going forward. We, uh, we also work on several of the elements of the space launch system, obviously Orion being the biggest one we have. And then um, our aeronautics team through our space team is actually building the composite structure that Dream Chaser, Sierra Nevada's um, next, next launch vehicle, or next space vehicle is gonna use. So we, we use the, the team in, in Fort Worth, Texas to build that, that shell. Down at the, the bottom left, you've got weather and remote sensing. <clears throat> uh, NASA, or we, we build the GOES satellites for NASA, which are the geostationary orbiting. Uh, basically, when you see stuff on the weather channel, it's coming from, from these, uh, these satellites, whether it's the satellite imagery, imagery hurricane tracking, and, and many, many other instruments that sit on those um, to help us, help us understand it. We do wind LIDAR, which is a, a, another kind of technology item that we're working on. The, the instruments that you see at the bottom there, GeoCarb is supposed is going to be an instrument that's going to help us understand, you know, what are we doing with the carbon in the atmosphere, how much is there, and, and you can see some others there too. Uh, GLM is a, a lightning mapper. Um, we're learning more and more that lightning gives us more um, indication or kind of be kind of a, a wink at us about some things that might be going on. Then we've done some commercial satellites. These are mostly for foreign uh, companies uh, that don't have the capability to do themselves. AR6 is over in uh, the Middle East, so it's uh, HS4 and then JCSAT is in Japan. Habitats is an area we're working on. Um, you know, if we do, when we get to the moon, we're going to have to have a way to live there. Uh, whether we have a gateway going around the moon or whether we have stuff on the moon, these are things that we're going to have to uh, work on as a team. And right now we're in the middle of a big competition for the, uh, for the lunar lander. <clears throat> so lunar exploration is, is big on our list here. One of the things that didn't make this list, but we do for DARPA, which you see up on the top left, is we're starting to work some of the nuclear propulsion efforts around that. So pretty excited about, about doing that as well. So really, really cool portfolio, a lot of great things to work on here. Um, and I'll talk about several of them as I go through. I picked a couple. So let's talk about exploring more. That, I thought that would be the thing we, that I could really poke on. You know, you think about our heritage here at Lockheed Martin, and, and uh, like I said, we've been part of every mission um <clears throat> that's gone there and and the success rate going to mars is pretty tough right this is a to give you an idea why things that i'm going to talk about the aero shell and the back shell and, and the heat shield why these are important we, we basically build these enclosures that hold our spacecraft when they go there and you can see if you look at the landers you can see several landers all the way back to the the mid 70s right and, and the latest being insight <clears throat> and, and you're going to see 2020 comes in orbiters. These are things that are going around Mars. It's one thing to have something on the on the on the surface of Mars, but you got to communicate up to something that can transmit the data back to Earth. Basically, a seven-minute lag uh, between between uh, Mars and, and Earth. And I remember, if, if any of you remember, in 2011 there was a when we landed um, Curiosity. Well, 2012 when we landed Curiosity on on Mars, the the, the landing sequence was so complex, we called it the seven minutes of terror uh, because of all the things that had to happen. And I remember thinking, wow, we're, we're worried about this seven minutes of terror and, and we're sitting in a control room waiting to get a signal back from the vehicle and knowing that it happened seven minutes ago. So you kind of, you feel kind of, it's kind of a weird feeling of helplessness, like not that we could have done anything anyway, but you already know, well, whatever happened, happened. We're just waiting to, to see the results. So that's pretty interesting dealing with that. So. Landers, orbiters, and air shells. Now, why are the air shells important? Well, and the heat shield and all these things. The atmosphere at Mars is thinner than the atmosphere here, in, here in, on Earth. And so when we come home on Earth and when we bring back, whether it's Crew Dragon or Crew Cargo from SpaceX or even Orion when we, when we do the test flight, you get a huge advantage of the thickness of our atmosphere. It actually slows you down. And as you go through the atmosphere, it actually turns into plasma. So the space shuttle went through this, you, know, you had these tiles that would just basically radiate the heat away. Very interesting uh, dynamic um, going through that. Well, you're typically going to get to, to get to space, right? You have to be going 17,500 miles an hour. So all those things that are orbiting up there, 
they're going 17,500 miles an hour at least. When we go to Mars, we're going a little bit faster, right? <clears throat> and so when you get there, I don't have, I, I can't take a lot of, I can't take propellant with me. This is one of the things we, we always balance. If I could take propellant and fire some retro rockets, I could slow myself down, but that's stuff I got to bring with me all the way from Earth. It's a very difficult engineering challenge. So what we do is we have these, these we, we spend a lot of time on heat shields and aero shells and those kind of things to try to, to, to fight through that. But even after we get through the atmosphere of Mars, we're still going too fast, right? And, and depending on the size of what we use, if you go back to the days of, of items like Spirit and Opportunity, we basically, in, in Pathfinder, we used airbags. We, we put big, big, huge airbags around them. So when it landed, it literally bounced across the surface of Mars. Well, with, with Curiosity and Mars 2020 or Perseverance, you can't do that, right? They're too big. So we used a sky crane. We actually came down, fired some small rockets to, to settle, and then lowered the, uh, the lander down to the surface of, uh, of Mars. And then the, the sky crane had its own, um, as, soon as, it, as soon as it took the load off, when it touched the surface of Mars, it just flew off, right? It crashed some, some, some ways away. So, so they got, you got to get kind of uh, creative with how you're going to, how you're going to land there. And so this is going to be one of the big challenges if we, when we start talking about taking humans to Mars, because, because the moon is a little, it's easier, frankly, because it has no atmosphere, right? You just, and, and, and it's so close, you can, you can bring propellant with you. It's a, it's a lot quicker trip. The other thing you'll find is we can only go to Mars, well, we, we typically go to Mars every 26 months. If, that's when launch windows open. And it's, and it's got to do with the orbits. If you ever want to see a cool thing, there's a, there's, if you if you wait too long or you miss your orbit or miss your opportunity, it can take you multiple years because you got to catch back up in the orbit. So we actually truly go when they talk about orbits have to align. That's when we launch. And we have small launch windows where we can do that. Um, Curiosity, for instance, was supposed to fly uh, in 2010, late 2009. Well, we couldn't we couldn't launch it until 2012 because of the because we missed the window. Right, we were having technical problems. Missed the window. Had to wait two years before we could go. So Mars is a tough putt, um, but we've got quite a bit of experience in, in in doing that. So what will the 2020 mission do when we when we think about this? You know, I think the goal here is really to understand the geology better, um, and then we're really looking for signs of life. We've sent sent enough stuff there that we've got um, a lot of opportunities to to kind of think about how. We're, how, how did, what happened to Mars? Is it something that we need to understand here on Earth, right? Because um, it could happen to us. It, we, used a, we used a spacecraft called MAVEN that showed where the solar wind has actually taken the atmosphere off of Mars. Mars may have used to have an atmosphere, but these winds have kind of ripped it off. Um, and, and, and here on Earth, we don't have that because we're protected by the, by the, the Van Allen belts and the magnetosphere around the Earth. Very interesting science stuff here. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. So what we're going to do with this rover is we've got these samples that are these uh, little tubes that we've created that are like mega clean and we're going to go start taking samples. And if you'll notice in the picture up here, there's a couple of these on the ground. That's where we're going to drill a core and put the sample and then we'll collect them later with what we're calling a mission called the Mars sample return. So pretty exciting, right? Because we want to bring those samples back um, and that's going to create all sorts of technologies that we're going to, have to develop to go actually get them and bring them back. Now, on this mission, we've actually we got we got this uh, helicopter called Ingenuity. Now, you know, helicopters need atmosphere to uh, to to fly, right? The blades don't have anything to to beat against, um, and so we we actually took this this particular um, helicopter, which is pretty big, but I could hold it in my hand like this. It's very light, very lightweight. The the blades are incredibly lightweight and huge because I'm still at a very low atmosphere situation. So we took that into a vacuum chamber, sucked the vacuum down to the same vacuum level that, or the same pressure level we'll see on Mars and proved we could actually fly it around. So this will be fascinating to see what we get back from that. Very much a technology demonstration and could be the kind of thing we need in the future to help crews, right? Imagine if you had, when you think about people today that use drones to go see what's over that mountain, right? We could do the same thing with crews in the future if we can get these to work. So they launched, they did launch in July of 2020 and they land February 18th. I think it's 20th or February 18th. And it's not 22, whatever that number is, it's 2021. 20, <laughs> nice typo there. So, um, and, and so the, the, it la it's supposed to, the goal of this one is to last one Martian year, which is 687 Earth days.
All right. The last thing I want to share with you before I before I open it up for for Q and A is um, the Osiris Rex mission, which is a, a mission that we did. Osiris Rex is a long, it's a very long acronym, but basically what it was was a mission to go to the asteroid Bennu and actually go down and take a sample off of it and bring that sample back with hopefully some understanding of origins of what created that asteroid. What can we learn from that? And so I don't know if you saw it, but it was a very successful thing and I'm going to show you if you'll watch this. Hopefully, the, hopefully this will work. It worked earlier. Um, takes a little while to load. So I'm holding my breath. Come on. Oop. So, oops, sorry, I messed that up. I got a little, I got a little impatient. So here it is going in. This is actual camera footage right about to hit. And then we blew a big charge of nitrogen to make a mess, right? So that particles would fly everywhere. And that head that you see down into the hole there is actually collecting samples. I mean, they're all just coming up inside of it. So this is the real, this is 200 million miles away, right? So pretty impressive video, pretty impressive data. Um, it's just unbelievable what we were, what we were able to do. Now, the story behind this, that's, that's very, to me, the, probably the most fascinating part of this story is when we look at these asteroids and we view them from Earth and for the, with the, the, the capabilities we have here, you don't get any, you don't, you don't have the resolution you see here. We don't know what they are. We, we kind of know what they're made of because of the sensors that look at them. But what we don't really know is, is what, what is our opportunity to, 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 when we get there, we think they look smooth, right? From here, it looks like they're really smooth. Well, that particular um, mission, when we got to the Bennu, there were boulders on it larger than school buses. And so as we're, we were there like a year, year and a half, trying to figure out, um, you know, trying to figure out where we would uh, land in the landing zones. And so the spacecraft was built to just kind of come straight down because we thought it was this nice soft asteroid, right? It was going to come straight down. We actually had to drive it through to, to land a place that we could pick. And, and 200 million miles away and we missed by about 24 centimeters the exact spot we wanted to hit, which is just, I mean, I, I just can't tell you how impressive that is. And we used it, we actually had a digital twin for the spacecraft and we did practice runs with that as if it was the real thing. And it was just, anyway, just great success. Can't wait to get that thing back. We, we, uh, we actually got so much that we actually jammed the, the closing mechanism, um, but we got that all closed up and locked up as quickly as we could before we lost any more, any more uh, um, material from there. So it's going to be fascinating. It comes back in a, in a couple of years, and we'll get to hopefully do the anal analysis around that. So that just kind of gives you an overview of what we're doing um, from a from from a perspective here at Lockheed Martin Space. What, what I'll share with you now before we jump into Q&A is, is, is um, you know, you, you can do, you can get involved with just about anything you want to get involved in uh, from this perspective. You guys are getting a great, a fantastic basis and foundation from which to jump off of and to, into business like this to do those kind of just crazy things. And I think if you, if you haven't learned it by being on this team, or, or you, I promise you will learn it, that the power of a team to do stuff greater than you could do by yourself is the most rewarding thing that I've ever been involved in. Um, when I was at, when I was in Tuscaloosa at, at school there, the, we had just really begun, this was, I'm not, it was a long time ago, 86. So we had just begun thinking of how you build teams. How do you bring teams together to get things done? It was before that it felt very individual, maybe is the way to look at it. So the way we've, the way we've changed the, the education piece, and the way we've thought about how we would do things um, differently in terms of having teams come together. It, it's just, for me, the most rewarding part of my career has been being on teams that accomplish stuff I know I couldn't have done by myself. And I think uh, for, for y'all, that's, the, that's the, the, the neat thing you have going for you there at the university and, and being on part of this team. So. Anyway, I've rambled enough. I'd, I'd really rather hear from, from every one of you in terms of what, what's on your mind. Um, so fire away with questions. Uh, we'll, 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 uh, I'll, I look forward to, I think what we'll get 
got everybody to what I don't want to keep y'all too late because I know some of you are, 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 are suffering from last night a little bit and some of you probably want to get out with your buddies tonight and celebrate but uh, Laura I'll let you just run it from here and and fire away uh, with anything you want no, nothing, everything everything's open here I'll tell you if it's off limits but don't don't be constrained <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much um, I will remind everyone in the chat, all the students, to fill out the poll that was posted in the chat, the attendance poll. Um, but I think we can start with some questions. Dr. Ricks asks, what served as your motivation to get involved in engineering and space applications in particular? Ah, good question. So, you know, I think <laughs> it's actually interesting. I, I came from a very small town. I'm from Montevallo, Alabama, which is about an hour away from T-Town. and. Um, pretty much I guess for me there was no engineering there and, and I'm gonna tell you a true story and, and you know if we if I was in the room with you you'd all kind of laugh but it's actually true um, I didn't really know what engineering was um, but in my school I was I was a I, I was I did well in math and science right I took all those tests that you take to get into college and it came out as math and science I was actually um, the editor of our newspaper and sports editor and all these things that I did and was thinking about going into journalism, if you can believe that. Um, and then my guidance counselor said, you know, you should be an engineer. And the funny story is my, and this is the honest truth because I had no role models, um, that, that I thought that meant I was going to drive a train. I mean, I, and, and I say that, and I, you know, truthfully, she says, oh, no, 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 an engineer, you know, that builds things and designs things. And I was like, oh, wow, I don't even know what that is. So that's what, but that's what sent me to, to Tus I was going to go to Tuscaloosa. That was a, a, you know, any of you that are from Alabama, you know, you have to declare pretty early, like when you're born, what school you're going to go to. I was, I was part of that generation that it was declared for me where I was going to school. So uh, not that I would have gone anywhere else, but I went to Tuscaloosa, was just incredibly fortunate. Um, you know, at the time, frankly, Auburn was considered the engineering school, but I had a, I mean, it was the perfect school for me. Um, I learned I learned as much as I needed to learn there, and then ultimately um, didn't really didn't you know I, I would say this whole co-op internship stuff that we do today uh, is is much more uh, much more uh, aggressive than when I was there. There wasn't that kind of thing. You could do co-ops, but it was a it wasn't quite as a, a big a deal as it is now. And so I didn't really start thinking. I, I did other things in the summer. You know, I actually stayed on campus. I was an RA. I did summer campus, summer conferences and stuff like that. Lived in Tutwiler every summer doing the camp, the, the conference camps. And then finally, you know, about my junior year, I said, golly, I, I, I got to start thinking about where I'm going to go to work. <clears throat> and um, I was, I was lucky enough to be dating someone from Huntsville, who's my wife of 34 years. And so I go to Huntsville and, and I went to the Space and Rocket Center and I just, I was hooked. I just, wow, this is all this stuff I've been studying, all these things I've been doing. You mean I could, I remember standing at the back end of the Saturn V with the five big F1 engines on the back and went, that's what I want to do. And so fortunately for me, I, I got a job that summer um, working on a space shuttle main engine test bid um, out in Marshall Space Flight Center's West Test Area. And the rest is kind of history. Um, but but I, guess, I, I guess you could say my motivation was that my my girlfriend at the time lived in Huntsville, right? So that's why I got into engineering. But but really, I think the once the hook got set on me, uh, any of you that have done internships with, with I mean, if you, to me, the, the big deal is find something you love and do what you love, right? And I just love working in space, working on the missions. There's nothing like it. And my advice to you is, if you're not like what you're doing, go get something else. You li your life's too long, right? I'm one of those old dudes now. Life's too long to not do stuff you enjoy and you're getting a great foundation and, and then being able to work on something, like I said, that's part of a team and accomplishing things that are so much greater than anything you could ever do uh, by yourself. is it's just, it's just, a, it's just incredibly rewarding, incredibly rewarding. So that's what motivated me. Uh, kind of a long answer, but that's what got me going. <clears throat> Thank you. We have a couple questions from Aiden. Uh, in your opinion, what's the coolest thing you've worked on at Lockheed Martin? At Lockheed, um, I, let, let me let me. I'm gonna I'm gonna expand that a little bit. I'm gonna talk about it in my career, right? So so I pick. I always pick early career, mid career, late career, and now I had Lockheed, right? 
so at, at NASA, um, my early career, I, I was able to work on the space shuttle main engine test bed. And, you know, being a, a very early career engineer um, and, and running a space shuttle main engine, that's the engine over my shoulder here that you can see in the back, you know, being able to count down a, a test, you know, the, the, the four hour countdown and being able to say, you know, engine start and uh, is a, was a, just a freaking awesome job. And, and, no, and feeling the building rattle you know, that you're in because that engine's running at 450,000 50, pounds of thrust. Um, that was, that was like a, I was like a adrenaline junkie back then. Um, so that was probably, that was probably the early career highlight. The, the mid career highlight for me was, was actually, um, being part of the shuttle, uh, the shuttle management team to launch space shuttles. Um, I owned the uh, shuttle propulsion office, which meant I was in charge of external tank boosters, solid rocket motors, and uh, the, the main engines. And it was just it was just so exciting to sit there at T minus nine minutes, shuttles out on the pad. You're in the firing room. Um, you got seven of your seven of your buddies sitting on top of this thing, and you get pulled. You know, shuttle propulsion, go no go, right? I, wow, that's a, that's a wild feeling, right? You got anxiety, excitement, all, all balled up into one. And you kind of know your team did the right thing and did everything. And again, it's being part of the team. Um, and to see those things lift off and get the astronauts to, to space safely. Fortunately for me, um, we closed out the shuttle program in a way that was, that was most, most effective. But being, being uh, on console for a shuttle launch, that was awesome. So in late career, probably it's going to surprise you a little bit, but when I was the acting administrator um, for NASA, the, the time I was acting was when the Obama administration left and the Trump administration came in. Um, and because we didn't have an administrator yet that Senate had confirmed uh, for the for, for uh, the White House, I, I was the voice of NASA inside the White House. So um, I was able to meet with Vice President Pence um, multiple times um, and meet with the president in the dining room in the private dining room of the Oval Office once. I, just incredible stuff. And I, I can remember you talk about I, I'm, I'm a pretty humble guy from Montevallo, right? It's a little small town. I graduated with 63 people. And I remember I called my dad and I said, hey, dad, I, I just got out of the Oval Office meeting with the president. And uh, he goes, do they know you? Do they really know who you are? Do they want you advising them? I said, Thanks, dad. Really appreciate it. But pretty exciting to be able to actually help shape policy um, for space and where the United States was going. Now, at Lockheed Martin, the, the coolest thing I've been involved here is I can't really talk about because it's the classified program. Um, just, just suffice it to say it, it fits the category of, uh, of uh, being part of a team and, and accomplishing something for the nation that, that, that was uh, pretty cool, pretty cool. Long answer, but sorry, I just, it, when, you, when you're as old as me, you can't just pick one thing. I, I, I never leave, I just pick one thing. <laughs> That's completely fine. Um, so another question from Aiden, how do you keep in touch with your team at Lucky Martin? Oh, wow, multiple ways, right? Especially during the pandemic, we've had to open the aperture on that. Um, Slack, AMAs, Zoom calls, um, AMAs, ask, I'm sorry, ask me anything. Um, the Zoom calls, we're spread out all over the place. So it's, it's geographically, so it's been kind of interesting. We, we already had ways, webinars and things like that, all hands that we do virtually. Um, that's really the main way um, for daily communication. Heck, it's email, text. We have an IM system here at Lockheed Martin that allows me to, to, to get with folks pretty quickly if I need to. So um, just, just we, we don't, I don't, I don't think there's anything we don't try to do to stay in touch because frankly, the, the big, the, our, one of our biggest drivers here is employee engagement, right? We want to make sure our teams are engaged. They, they understand what we're doing. They understand the mission. Um, and during the pandemic, this has been kind of, it hadn't been hard. It's just been, we've just had to make sure we're, we're maintaining that because keeping our eye on the mission and what we need to do for the, for our customers is critical, right? Whether it's the Air Force, the Navy, NASA, we just got to keep our eye on the ball. They're expecting that and that's what our teams need to do. So we, we don't close off any opportunities for, for calm. Thank you. I have a question from Dalton. 
Does Lockheed plan on assisting in future missions to other planets or moons, such as Europa? Absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're, uh, we, we constantly work with the, uh, what we call the principal investigators. There's several of those. The way NASA does it on those kind of exploration missions is the award typically, there's a print, there's somebody that wants to own the science. It's, it's science led. So there'll be a, there'll be what's called a principal investigator. And that's the person that proposes the science they want to, they want to prove or not prove whatever they have a hypothesis and they're going to go prove. So take Europa, for instance, the, the first mission to Europa, which is uh, the Europa Clipper is actually going to map Europa and talk about where we might put a lander, but we've also, but also made, depends on where they, where they go with this, they may try to fly through one of those plumes to see if they can detect what's actually in those plumes. Um, and then that principal investigator will work with companies like me or somebody else, like Northrop Grumman, for instance, is building James Webb Space Telescope. Um, Lockheed Martin is building, built Juno, and, and it becomes one of those cases where um, we get to be part of the competition process, but we're, that, that's our sweet spot. We like, we are very aggressive in trying to help the agency get their missions done and the principal investigators get their stuff done that way. OSIRIS-REx, we built OSIRIS-REx, but the principal, it, it, the principal investigator is uh, Dante Laurenta down at the University of Arizona, so. That's very interesting. I have a question from Brayson. How do you account for lower gravity in the tests of these rovers and landers, such as for the calibration of the flying machine on Mars? Yeah, it's tough, right? So, so the helicopter was actually kind of, I won't say easy, it was easier, right? Because I could put the I could put the uh, helicopter here on Earth, I could put it in a vacuum chamber and, chamber and suck the vacuum down so, and, and create the atmospheric conditions that I would see on Mars. But you still, but the, the bigger challenge is actually with spacecraft that are, that are just in space, right? Because there is no gravity, right? And even I can simulate all day long here as much as I can. So we use thing, but it's tough because you still have gravity here. Um, so, so think about two spacecraft that have to mate in space, right? You, you, it, it's hard to test that here because in space, if I fire a thruster, this is, if you, you talk about the a reaction has an equal and opposite reaction in space that you see that constantly, right? There's no friction, there's nothing, right? You, you fire a thruster and you're gonna go, you're gonna go the opposite direction of the thruster. So you have to, have to do that. So what we typically do is we have what, there are a lot of places that we call flat floors and they're like, just imagine a big air hockey table, right? It's a way to make, to make these two spacecraft operate here and take away, um, uh, take away the, the, the gravity by putting them on air, right? And so and you have air thrusters that blow and it just moves all around the place. But it's, it's still hard, right? A, that's one of the bigger challenges because you want to test as you fly, as we, as we like to say, and that's about the only way we know how to do it. Now, one of the other things we've been able to do is prove a lot of this. We, we actually have started using models and, and, and really complex digital models to let us, let us do some of that. But that's how, we, that's how we, have to, we have to account for it. There are some things we do, like there, if, if you think about it, um, I'll use solar arrays, for example. Solar arrays, to get them to space, they have to be very lightweight, okay? Very lightweight. And they are very lightweight, and they're complex. You see a solar array on some of these pictures, and you go, huh, oh, look at that big, trust me, they're very, some of the most complex things we do. But they're very lightweight, so if I actually, and we have to unfurl them, right, in, in, in a, uh, to, to verify them here on the ground. Problem is, what they need to what they need for support in space is not what they need here on the ground. Gravity would actually actually snap them off of the spacecraft, right? But in space, doesn't matter because you don't have the gravity. So we do counterbalances so that when we unfurl them, we take the load, right? We have uh, ground support equipment that'll hold the load so that it doesn't break. So th there's all sorts of things we have to do from that from a design perspective. Fun stuff, though. I mean, that's the kind of challenges that that everybody likes like to do. Very good. We have a question from Jonathan. Are there many engineers who have experience working both for NASA and within the private sector? Do you find that you have a unique perspective as a result of that experience? There, there's several of us. I think, um, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's, it's unique, right? I think it's more, um, every experience you get, just get, I, I call it scar tissue, right? Everywhere you go, you get more scar tissue that helps you in the next role you take. Um, there are there are a lot of there are a lot of folks like me that that leave the government and go into jobs like I'm in here at, at, at in, in, in industry 
but I'm not doing much engineering anymore, right? I'm in a, I'm in a senior management position and um, I've got a bunch of engineers that work for me, right? We have a ton of, we have, I think in space of our 21,000 folks, I think about 12,000 are in what we call our engineering and technology organization. So the real, the, that, that when, when you, when you get to a certain level where you're, you know, I was brought in not so much for engineering, but for management and leadership capabilities, right? Um, it's how, it's how we look at it when you get up to these certain levels. Now you got to have the engineering background. You got to have the, 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 you know, the, the technical chops to go with it, whatever your discipline is, by the way, whether your business, you know, if you want to be a CFO, you got to have some technical chops to go through the financial side. And so, so what I've found is that, that I do bring a different perspective here because I used to be the customer, right? I used to be Lockheed Martin's customer and now NASA is my customer. So there is an advantage to maybe knowing some of the uniqueness around the language and things like that. Um, but there, I would say I'm not quote unique from that standpoint. I think there are a lot of folks that have done that generals and senior executives and other agencies that, that, that retire and, you know, they get the itch to, like I did, I mean, the itch to get back into the mission, right? That's what drives you. And so uh, that's what we, that's what I did. We have somewhat of a related question from Grayson. Um, if one wants to be constantly involved in construction of rovers and satellites, is it more advantageous to work for NASA directly or for a major contractor like Lockheed? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm going to be biased here, I know, but uh, so I, so take it with a grain of salt that I work at Lockheed, so I'm biased. I, I actually think what you have to do is you, you need, it depends, right? It really depends on where you end up in NASA and what NASA, what the role NASA is going to uh, have you do. Um, and what I mean by that is NASA actually 85% of the dollars that NASA gets are actually they go out in a procurement, uh, an acquisition, right? So they pay people like us, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, Jacobs, all these different companies, they, they actually go buy a lot of the work and talent. So I would encourage you, great opportunities. I mean, I was lucky. I got to run engine testing for, for NASA when I was there. I got to work on the shuttle program. But even when I worked, when I did engine, engine testing, I was actually, you know, it was a NASA team, right? That's a big deal. And we had to contract support um, in shuttle. It was a NASA team, but the but the main pieces were built by Lockheed, Boeing, Orbital ATK, or Northrop Grumman now, right? So, so they did a lot of the, the engineering. So I think it really depends on where you where you want to land and what you want to do. But but like, you know, if you build satellites, Goddard Space Flight Center in, in Maryland builds satellites, right? Um, and they have support teams to do that. But a lot of times they actually buy the satellites from folks like us. So that's the it, it just depends on where you land in those organizations. Um, is to, is to what you could, the, I would call it the hands-on versus the, the systems engineering or the management approach. And it also depends on what you're interested in, right? Um, going in. So there's lots of opportunities on both sides is what I would tell you. Um, but I, I can tell you, we're always gonna be involved in building the rovers and with Jet Propulsion Lab, you know, that's our, that's our partner, right? Is JPL and, and, and a lot of those and, and then the NASA Science Mission Directorate and, and NOAA for the satellites that we've built here on the commercial civil side. We also built some for the national defense side with GPS and, and early warning satellites. So, anyway, but we, but we build those here. We don't we don't uh, we don't farm that out, right? So you just gotta I think you just gotta pay attention in in terms of what you want to do, where you think you can get the most bang for that buck for you personally. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting myself. Um, thank you. I actually have a question. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Lockheed's work with nuclear thermal propulsion? Yeah, so we just got into this. We just got a, a technology, well, we've been doing it for a long time, um, but we just got into a technology activity with DARPA where, um, where they, they want us to help build the system that would, that, that, you know, everything's a system when it comes to that. You've got a reactor, you've got a uh, a, an engine, I say that carefully, right? It's really just a nozzle, a, cham a combustion chamber and a nozzle. And then you've got a system around it. And so we're gonna be working on the system side of that because um, we we're not gonna do reactors and things like that. Um, so so this is a new one for us. It's kind of a technology development to see what kind of, what, what we can do. I think that's kind of the next step for in-space propulsion. Um, so pretty excited about that, um, that one going forward. So it just got started, but it's, it's, a, it's an area, a growth area for us, we think. Um, if the government chooses to go down that path in the future. Thank you. 
And then Dr. Ricks has a couple of questions. Does Lockheed have a role in the proposed Artemis missions? Yes, we do. We, uh, the, the Orion is part of that, is part of that, the, the crew, which is the crew capsule that we're, that we're taking uh, to and from the moon um, as part of Artemis uh, to carry the, the, the first woman and the next man um, back to the moon. So that's our, that's our biggest contribution. The other part we're in the middle of a competition for is for the lander. Um, and that's, that's a, we're a partner in, in to Blue Origin, who, who is uh, kind of the prime for that particular job, but we're building the ascent element, which is the element that'll take the crew off of the surface of the moon. They're building the descent element. And so the way it will work is space launch system. Well, the way it'll work is we'll launch the ascent element, the descent element, and then we'll launch the crew and the law and, and a transfer element that North Grumman's building. We'll launch the crew. Once those all get put together, the crew comes up on the space launch system and Orion docks with that and goes to the moon. And then the crew comes down in the, in the combined descent and ascent element, lands on the moon, does their mission, and then the ascent element leaves and the descent element stays on the moon. So very involved in that. Um, NASA's talking about a gateway, which would be almost a, Think about a habitat, think about a, a very small part of the International Space Station today. Think about that at the moon, uh, basically like a one, one node kind of place where, where you can come up from the moon, you dock and you get an Orion and go back to Earth. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the major pieces that we have right now. We're also looking at some of the turret, uh, uh, surface operations. We think we have some, some ability to do some things around um, the rovers, the, the infrastructure that will be needed for power and communications as well, since that's a strength of ours. Thank you. And then Dr. Ricks has one last question that pertains specifically to our, uh, our project here. What were the launch dimensions and mass for the latest Mars rover? Oh man, that's, <laughs> I, I just said it's about the size of a Mini Cooper. How about that? Uh, and I don't know the mass. Um, I should know, but I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, but that's why we call it a Mini Cooper. That's about the, si the size that goes in there. Um, but it's about, I can tell you that it's, that it's, from a mass standpoint, it's about as much as we can throw on an Atlas launch vehicle, which is what it's going to launch on, or what it, what it launched on. So that, that usually, usually the thing that limits our mass is the launch vehicle. Um, you know, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting process that you go through um, where you land, you start with what, what you're landing and where, and you work your way backwards to see what it takes to uh, get it off of earth. Uh, you know, cheating gravity, as I say, is really tough <laughs> to get things off the, off of, off of the surface of, of, of the earth. It's a, it's a it, that's the hard part, right? And then once you, once you get it off there, it's pretty easy to move, maneuver in space. Thank you very much. That puts some things into perspective. Um, we are currently building a, a robot that is about the size of a Labrador. So <laughs> there's some different challenges that come with that. Oh yeah. Uh, we have another question from Brayson. Kind of a silly question, but in your experience, how long does it take to make the acronyms for the missions? <laughs> well, that's an important part of it, right? You gotta, you gotta get something catchy. Um, no, I, I, you, you, I don't know how long it takes. But some of these teams just amaze me with what they come up with. Um, just to, you know, things like Osiris Rex, which is, I, I'm not gonna try to remember what that is, but it's the origins of something. Da, 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 da. I know that O stands for origins, um, but, but there's a lot, of, a lot of fun that goes into that for the teams to make it catchy and, and, and attractive, right? From a standpoint of what you're, what you're trying to do. So, uh, but, but that's that's where you let the team kind of innovate and have some fun um, as, they, as they do these things. Thank you very much. I think we're almost to the end of our time together. I'll let uh, a couple more people, if, if we have a couple of more questions, we'll see if any pop up in the chat. But I would like to take a moment to thank you very much for stepping into to talk to us tonight, a very informative and uh, entertaining presentation. Thank you. Well, I appreciate y'all having me. And, and as I told Dr. Ricks, you know, if hopefully we can get to the point where we can travel, but if we can't, because I want to come, I want to bring a couple of folks down to see what y'all are doing and, and, and show them. I've still got a couple of pictures from probably three years ago 
Dr. Ritz, when you took me to your to your test bed uh, that, I, that I was showing the teams here um, that we have. But I want to bring some of the technical team down. And uh, it's really, uh, really cool what you're doing. And, and I think it's a neat program and, and one that's very applicable to what we're doing. So I wish you all the best of luck. And look, I call on us, right? We're investing for a reason. We'll see you all be successful. And um, you know, if we can help with design reviews or thoughts, and, and we're, we're, we're here. So good luck and uh, roll tide. Hey, Robert, thank you very much. Really appreciate your time and uh, really appreciate your great presentation. You had a, you had a lot of real good, uh, a lot of real good anecdotes that, uh, that I really enjoyed hearing. Um, yeah, if we can get you on campus, that'd be great because we got a nice new lab since you've been here before. So we'd love to show off that new facility. And um, like Laura said earlier, we really appreciate you guys' financial support for our team. And um, we're looking forward to that continuing. Uh, I've been in contact with a couple of the folks that you've uh, that you introduced me to, and yep. we're getting some we're getting some information about uh, about uh, your automated machine shop kind of stuff that's going on, as well as uh, maybe even some possible research type of collaborations moving forward. So uh, thanks again for all your support for your time tonight, and uh, uh, let us know if there's anything that we can do. And if you get a chance to travel, let us know when you're available. We would love to host you. All right. We all take care, and uh, good luck with everything. Yes, Talk sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.